Hey, what's up, everybody? Uh, I forgot to mention, so I'm going to plug this in before um, the actual recording of the podcast starts, that this whole episode is on my YouTube channel. So you can watch the YouTube video uh, so you can get a little visual. I pull up my Training Peaks uh, run so that you get to see what I'm actually analyzing. So uh, if, um, if you need a deeper dive and a visual, please hop on over to the YouTube link. I've included that in the show notes. So check that out. Okay, and again, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Hello, welcome to the Running is Life podcast. This is Coach Aaron Saft, and I'm going to apologize up front. I have an extremely sore throat. <laughs> um, but uh, I planned on recording this, and um, I had a great question come in from Drew um, over Instagram. And I promised I would answer this, so I am going to do so. So, again, forgive me for my voice. But um, Drew's question was, how can he estimate a finish time in a 100-mile race? It sounds like Drew has a 30-hour time limit, and he kind of wants to estimate his finish time, which is a really great question. And it's very difficult to establish that estimated time because there's so many variables within a 100-mile race. So that said, there's a few things that you can do to estimate your time. The first is quite simply look up your results and look at um, people that were around you. And you're going to have to do a little bit of digging and find runners that are around your finish time or around your um your i guess your percentage that ultra sign up gives us as uh, as wonky as those are but it is a good metric to understand your level of running versus someone else's level of running uh when you look at their their percentage their rank if you will okay they should have a similar amount of results and they should have, you know, similar finish times in similar events, if not the same events, so that you can compare them. And then hopefully you can look at their finish time from this 100 miler that they did previously. Uh, again, you might have to do a little bit of digging and make sure that the course was the same. But that's one way that you can estimate a finish time. Now, again, you may want to reach out to this runner and say, you know, how did this race go? What, is it a legitimate comparison? In other words, do they have a decent race or do they have a really bad race? So you don't just say, well, you know, here's what I'm guessing my finish time is going to be based off of this finish time. Uh, so anyway, all that said, do a little bit of, of homework, a little bit of, of groundwork, reach out to, to runners, okay? Kind of find out how the race went for them. That way you have a comparison, okay? That's, that's one way to do it. Right. So use ultra sign up as a tool, right? To compare yourself. Okay. That's one way. Now, the next way takes a lot of kind of digging as well. Okay. So each way is going to take a little bit of legwork to do. Okay. This one, you're going to use a, um, a comparative effort or race or run on, uh, a similar, if not the same course. Okay, so this effort, if you're you know looking to find a hundred mile estimated time, should be somewhere in the ballpark of forty miles to one hundred k. Okay, that's that's what we want to use for distance in comparison. Hopefully, it's within your build. Okay, um, so if you haven't done this and it's getting too close, obviously this is not a good way to do it. I would use the ultra sign up way. Okay, so if we're getting really close to race day um, and you haven't done this, just ignore this one. <laughs> but what I'm doing is bringing up this is my heartbreaker 50 mile data. Okay, this is what I uploaded to Training Peaks. Uh, and I've <laughs> had a few questions while we're talking about that, about, you know, where am I at? And I'll talk about that <laughs> at the end here. I want to answer Drew's question first, but this is heartbreaker 50 miler. Okay. Um, this is my data from the race. This is on the Hellbender course. So this is how I used um, my data to give me kind of a, a ballpark figure as to what I can anticipate running at Hellbender, given that Hellbender has 
a, you know, a nice day, a good day, and I have a good day, right? So this is going to be from my A goal, right? Again, I'd suggest creating a B and a C goal, right? So my A goal is 27 and a half hours, and I'm going to tell you how I arrived at that. My B goal is 30 hours, and my C goal is, uh, well, if I go over 30 hours, I probably just need to stop because I got to get to the kids' state qualifying meet for track. So um, I'm, I'm hoping to achieve my B. I can't do a C. Like most people can just do just finish, right? So whatever the, you know, the final cutoff is, that's usually your C goal. I don't have that option. Okay, so I'm, I'm kind of limited to an A and B goal. Um, I'm not going to let it put pressure on me. If the day is not there, the day is not there. I just need to um, understand that because I need to get to the, the track meet and be with the kids. So I'd rather sacrifice that and be a part of their their day than to uh, to finish this and uh, and miss them. Because, uh, you know, in my mind, I'm already being selfish enough <laughs> and running Hellbender. So um, I need to to make a little bit of sacrifice as well. So anyhow, this is the heartbreaker. OK, this was in my build. This was uh, you can see here Saturday, March 23rd. OK, race date for Hellbender is um, May 10th. OK, so I had plenty of time in between the two. Um, and so a few things here. Um, what we want to do, uh, if you do not have let's start with that, if you do not have a race that is on the course that you are doing. OK, and you can't go train on that course and do a comparative effort like a training run, a long training run on that course. What you do want to do is find something that's comparative in elevation, gain and loss. Don't forget about the loss part. OK, and what you're going to do to calculate that is you are going to add the total amount of elevation gain plus the total amount of elevation loss, and then divide that number by 100. And again, that is going to give you the average amount of gain and loss over the course. Okay. So with that said, um, you're going to want to replicate that in this event. Okay. So I was fortunate enough, Heartbreaker is on the Hellbender course. So I have a direct comparison, which is awesome. If you don't, Again, you you're gonna probably have to jump on all trails, or Gaia, or Caltopo, or any of those mapping um, the apps or online um, websites that allow you to plot the course to try to find something replicable, right? Something that is in the ballpark of the race you're doing, and perhaps your race is completely flat, which you know if it is, that's pretty easy. But if it has a lot of elevation gain. You know, again, take that into account and, and build that into your course. Make sure it is um, comparable to what you will be racing to give you a better estimate as to how you did. OK, now here uh, I'm going to hide the uh, the pink and the yellow lines. That's pink is my my power, which I don't believe the watch can accurately record. And yellow is my cadence. OK, so I'm going to hide those and i'm just going to show my pace okay now perhaps you don't have access to training peaks that's fine you can create a free account that's you know that's within <laughs> there is a free account on training peaks so you can use training peaks um the premium adds a few other features but the, you know the the uh, the free account is great so you can use training peaks if you don't have training peaks and you you look back at strava you can still use strava to look at this data OK, so and if you don't have either of those, um, look at your watches app. So if you have a Garmin, look at the Garmin Connect. If you have Coros, look at your Coros app, wherever you can dig into the data. And I suggest looking at it at your on your desktop so you can have it in big, expansive view as I have it here. OK, the only other metric that I hit everything, uh, the only other one that I want to see is elevation gain. OK, so when we're looking at this data, I want to see the elevation, the elevation profile and my pace. OK, those are the two variables that we want to see. All right. Um, now, <clears throat> uh, the next piece is you have to be very good at understanding the effort. Right now, whether it be that you run off of rating of perceived exertion or RPE whether you run off of heart rate, 
you have to understand what your metrics are telling you. Okay. Now, again, I didn't have heart rate on this one. I didn't wear my heart rate strap, so I don't have that data. So here I'm basing this off of my rating of perceived exertion. And then I can also look at my pace. How did my pace do? And that's something we're going to dive into here and talk about what the pace looks like. Okay. Um, so with that said, um, this was to replicate Hellbender to my best. I didn't want to race this. This was not me going out to race, right? This was me going out to figure out where I'm at in my training so that I knew for Hellbender. Sure, I, I still wanted to do well, right? But I wasn't focused on what place I was in, how fast I was running. I was focused on my effort. That was the big goal on this, to understand where I was at so I could have a comparable to look back at and say, okay, is my goal realistic to run 27 and a half hours, right? So I confirmed that by looking at my data here. All right. So one thing that you can look at is your starting pace versus your finishing pace. Okay. Um, here, and, you know, again, have to kind of compare where you were out on the course. This was, um, we, we went out a little bit on, uh, forest service road and then we were on a um another road slash dirt road till we got to our first climb which was snooks okay so you can see we started out a little bit hot <laughs> as we always do right so um running 8 11 pace here just i'm just going to take a a, a a data point you can see this is kind of high here Okay, so um, maybe my median is more like 825 to 830 pace. We'll just say that's where I started. Now, when I look at the finish, okay, look here, I am still able to manage that even at this low point, 838 pace. Okay, so at the start, comparable to the finish, because I was back on Jarrett Creek Road. Okay, that's the nice thing here is I have two comparable uh, points, data points, because of the start and finish were very similar. Right. So I'm looking at similar points to compare. And if you can look at similar points near the start and near the finish, that's what we want to do. My paces did not diminish. That means that I was able to finish strong, that I didn't go out too hard and I didn't push too hard during the race. I was still able to sustain the same paces at the end that I was at the beginning. OK, that's a good sign that that's a really good sign. That's a green flag. That's like you did things right, okay? If at the end, you just notice you're on a steady decline and you don't have major climbs or anything that would warrant that, you have to understand that, oh, I went too hard up front or somewhere in the middle, right? That's what that's what that tells us, okay? So we're just analyzing the data here and comparing points, okay? They have to be similar points, like I said, and these are very similar points. So I have a good comparison. Okay, so I know that this worked out well. I did well here. Okay, uh, so my, you know, my rating of perceived exertion was right where it should be, right throughout the event. I kept it moderate. I kept it within myself, and I yielded the results that I wanted to see. I did not decline. Okay, now a lot of these drops and paces, there's some hills, right? So those drops and paces were me just simply hiking, and that's the next component we're going to talk about. OK, we're going to look at average pace on our climbs because that's going to give you a good indication based on how you were feeling as to what you should be doing for your climbs moving forward. So, you know, your average pace and, you know, your RPE on those climbs. OK, so again, here, this is our climb up Snook's Nose okay, um, and up to the top of Green Knob. Now, this is a massive climb. OK, Snook's is about 3000 feet of gain in about three miles. That's huge. Right. So if I'm looking at my average pace, I'm about 20 minute pace. OK, 20 minute pace um, on the, the steep portion of this. Now, if I go over to Mount Mitchell, OK, this is our Mount Mitchell climb. OK, so we're going up Mount Mitchell Trail right here. This is a cross Buncombe Horse Trail. Uh, you know, I, I, obviously, I'm very <laughs> familiar and well versed with the trails up there. And then this steep pitch right here, that's Big Tom. That's where I broke my pole. OK, so um, anyway. You can kind of see the paces, okay, um, as I go here, all right? the uh, As we're climbing, there's some, you know, there's some faster points, but look, 1828, right? So I'm still climbing even probably a little bit quicker than I was on Snooks. Now, again, you know, they're they're not exactly, right, the same, 
because they're different climbs, but they're pretty comparable. Uh, they're both single track, both have some technicality to them, both have a, a, a pretty severe steepness to them. And I'm actually, I'm going pretty good right there. Um, so, you know, there's, that's two climbs. Okay. And then I pop over here. This is the climb up Salto and up Bald Knob Ridge. Okay. Long final climb. Okay. We're deep into the race now. You know, we're, we're well over 50 K into this race. Um, so looking there, 1646 pace. Okay. Now I have to take into account going up Salto is a road. It's a dirt road, less technical, right? Obviously, um, not as steep, but faster. I'm still able to maintain a faster hiking pace going up this, right? So that tells me I wasn't too wiped out. Another good sign, right? I didn't go too hard early on because I was still able to sustain a very good hiking pace. Okay. So all good signs right there. Again, if you're diminishing, right? If you're if your capacity to hike uphill is getting slower and exponentially slower, then that's a red flag. Okay. That's no good, right? It means you were going too hard too early. So you have to look at those paces early on and say, oh my goodness, I really, you know, I, I was pushing too hard on the early climbs, which is not what we want to do, right? In Hellbender, that's my biggest, you know, advice to runners is to take the front half easy. Right. And that's that goes for any hundred miler. Right. We talk about the 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 saying waste minutes early to save hours late. Right. Because if I if I'm slower up front, right, just because I want to be conservative, I can either maintain or as you see right here, I can go faster in the tail end and I'll be passing people and getting, you know, closer to the finish that much quicker. Right. So waste minutes early, go slower early to save hours later. You know, we don't want to slow down so much. That's, you know, that's the that's the idea here. OK, so that's looking at climbs. You can also do the same for descents to kind of see how you were doing on descents. You can look at the pace in comparison. You know, did I slow down on descents or did I speed up again? They need to be comparable. Right. We have to be comparable when we look at these. But that's that's another factor that you can look at. But the climbs do tell you a big story, okay? So look at your average pace early versus average pace late on a comparable surface. Look at your climbs. You know, break your climbs apart. Now, the nice thing about climbs is you can on training peaks is that you can actually create a segment here. I can click here. I can drag all the way through the climb, and then you can see I created a new selection, right? So in training peaks, I can now have this new data point, and I can go down. Oops, I can go down here. And I can find my new data point. And with that data point, I can kind of analyze um, that data. Okay. So uh, that's why I kind of like, um, I like uh, training peaks because I can, I can go through and I can look at, you know, that, that segment and get the information on that segment. Okay. So that's, uh, um, that's that piece. Okay. All right. Moving on. Um, so I've got this, you know, I've got this uh, data, right? I've got this in front of me. I'm looking at this, um, this as a whole now, okay? I'm looking at a finishing time of roughly, it was almost 51 miles. Uh, let's just call it 1130, right? It took me 11 hours and 30 minutes to complete, uh, we'll just say a 50 mile run. All right. Now, taking that into consideration, this is not the the simple math, Okay. Yeah, it's it's a little rough. I'm I'm saying okay, if I double that, that's going to be what twenty three hours. Okay, now uh, of course in a hundred mile we do expect to be a little bit slower on the back half. Okay, with Hellbender it may be that it's slower on the front half because that's it's heavy loaded with climbing, right? So we may be slower on the front half and hopefully back faster on the back half. But with that said. Um, I don't anticipate that I could sustain two 11 and a half hour efforts. I couldn't do 23 hours. That's kind of, you know, that's not, that's not what this suggests. Okay. You have to add on a little bit due to the fatigue of a hundred miles. You're doubling this. So there is going to be some fatigue and that's where the 27 and a half hours came in. Right. So if I, if I double this, I'm at 23 hours. So I'm giving myself four and a half additional hours, okay? That's on the high side, okay? That's on the high side. 
I'm being way, um, uh, I'm overestimating. Okay. I'm hoping I can run faster, but the reality is I'm, I'm giving myself plenty of time for fatigue in this race. Okay. That's where I bumped up four and a half hours to say, okay, this is a big window, right? So I, I have somewhere between, let's just say 23 hours and 27 and a half hours is what I'm estimating based off of this data. Okay. This went extremely well. I had an extremely good day. Now, the reason I add that much time is because there can be other factors that come into play on race day. And that's what you have to consider. Okay. So um, this was an extremely good weather day. It really didn't get that hot. Got a bit more warm towards the end of the day. But when we were up on Mitchell, it was in the 30s. Okay. So this was actually a pretty cold you know, nice, nice running weather day. Hellbender could potentially have hot weather. We could see temperatures in the 80s. Okay, I say hot, but we'll say warm weather. And it could be in the 80s during the day here. That is another potential for a slower time. Okay, because if we're looking at, let's say, 11 a.m. to say 5 p.m., where we're going to be in the 80s, that's going to slow pace down, right? So that's that's where that big expansive four and a half hours came from is I have to factor in that. Now, if you've done your, your run, your, your 40 to hundred K run, and it was in cooler temps, consider the weather, consider humidity, right? Humidity can be higher. That can also play. Okay. Now, if you did this at a lower altitude and you're racing at a higher altitude, another factor to consider a slowdown factor, add time, how much time it depends depends on how high you're going in altitude right there unfortunately there's no equation there's no equation to plug in and say you know oh, well i'm going this much higher how much slower per mile um, there there isn't one just know that you're going to have to add on some time unless you have the time to get out there early and hopefully acclimate a bit more so that it doesn't slow you down as much okay but if you are not able to go out there and acclimate figure on adding a little bit of time as well so there's those external factors. Consider those, okay? Um, then what you have to do, okay, is assess your overall training. How has your overall training gone? How much in compliance are you for the overall plan? Okay, if you're 85% compliant, in other words, if you've got in 85% of the work that you had hoped, you're you're in good shape. I would say, you know, if your goal is, you know, as mine, then, hey, you're probably going to be okay. Training-wise, anything can happen on race day, right? But training-wise, you're okay. If you are less than that, let's say you're 75%, you should probably add on a little bit of time to what you're expecting, okay? That's, that's you know, just the reality. We want to make sure that we're not overestimating our ability, right? So another thing to consider you know, your percent of compliance. Okay. So take that into cons consideration as well. Okay. Um, and then, you know, man, um, what else can I say, Drew? Um, hopefully that gives you, um, uh, a really good overview of how to look at and predict your hundred mile time. Okay. Um, it's, a, uh, it's certainly, <laughs> certainly not an exact science in either case. Remember, there's the ultra sign up way to do it. Then there's looking at your data. Okay. Um, it's if you have uh, a friend, a coach, someone that can look through it with you, that's fantastic. Okay. Um, it, it really is worth the analysis to kind of say, is this realistic? Okay. Um, but unfortunately, there's no tried and true way to say this is an exact science and this is what I can anticipate, especially with a 100 miler. But this should give you a rough estimate as to, you know, OK, I can expect this time, you know, to tell my crew, my pacers, and then you can use ultra pacer to kind of come up with a guideline as to, OK, so I should be coming through these aid stations roughly at about this time. OK, so use the tools that are out there to, you know, to. Um, to not only create routes, but to analyze the routes. Because you can actually, I have, you know, I had a plan for Ultra Pacer. I can now take this data, 
plug it back into Ultra Pacer and see how did it go according to the Ultra Pacer plan. You can also analyze and compare that. And that's probably a whole nother podcast. <laughs> but, you know, I think this should give you a good idea of, of how to look at your data and assess where you're at and what to expect for your 100 miler. Okay, I really hope that helped, Drew. If you have further questions, don't hesitate to ask. It was a great question, and I appreciate you asking. Um, all right, let's move on here. Um, other things that are going on. Tomorrow, I will be interviewing um, uh, Tim Nooney. Uh, Tim was just on the Adventure Jogger podcast, kind of funny timing. Um, we seem to have similar timelines on our guests. But um, Tim uh, and I are going to talk about being a professional runner. And how does that compare um, to when I started? Tim is with La Sportiva. La Sportiva was my first sponsor. So we're going to talk about, you know, what it looked like then and what it looks like now. And then he has a, another topic that's of, of you know, pretty cool interest. I, I wasn't familiar with the trail of which he spoke, but we're going to speak on uh, um, a trail out west and see if that's something that would, you know, maybe work here in the east. So um, some pretty cool stuff we're going to talk about with Tim. Um, I've continued to reach out to the Forest Service. Uh, I want to talk about user trails, you know, user trails being ones that weren't created by the Forest Service, but we use ourselves um, because somebody went out there and built them on their own without Forest Service approval. So I'm um, going to talk about the impact that can have and why the Forest is trying to crack down on it. OK, so uh, stay tuned for that. Um, so some some good stuff coming up. Um, getting onto my my personal training, I've had a number of questions about, am I okay? I'm fine. I'm fine. Other than this sore throat. Um, as I described a few episodes ago, I really just got tired of wearing a watch and being confined to metrics. You can see I'm not wearing my watch. Um, I haven't been wearing my watch and that's why you haven't seen anything on Strava. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not that I don't want to share my training. That's not the case. I just want to enjoy my running. And I was really becoming um, burdened by having a watch on. Um, I talked about that a few episodes ago, and and I've just really been enjoying my running again. I just go out for a run and just listen to my body, you know, go out for a, a non-specified amount of time. I may just say, hey, I want to go out and run this loop today. And that's what I do. And, uh, you know, I'm like, well, you know, I, I've got to this point, kind of feel like I, you know, I'm done. So I'm going to head back. And so it's been great. It's, you know, I, I just kind of wanted to get back to enjoying my running um, without, you know, looking at the metrics all the time. I actually downgraded my my training peaks account. It was about to renew. And I figured I, I just don't need to yeah, to to be uh, to diving deep into the metrics, especially since I'm really not even tracking them. So uh, it's, you know, it's not that I haven't been training. I've been training. I've been running. I've been having fun. I've been doing good. Um, everything is still full bore for, uh, for hellbender. So I appreciate you guys asking. <laughs> There's no injuries. My ankle's okay. Um, it, you know, it's, uh, it's not hundred percent. I'm working on it though. Um, Will Franz, the strength coach, uh, sent me, um, a, uh, a, a kind of a regimen to help, you know, with the ankle. So I'm working on the ankle and I'm still out there running, um, I've also kind of just recognized that in the spring, it's just really tough for me to put in a lot of time out there because um, the uh, high school is just really, really um, busy. <laughs> we race a lot. Um, we had such great results this past Saturday at the Carolina Distance Carnival. The kids did amazing. Uh, we had so many PRs in the 800 in the mile. Uh, and we had one of our guys race the two mile. He ended up winning the elite heat. There was only one heat of 20 people they took for the meet. And he ended up winning and setting a huge PR. Uh, my son set a PR in the 800, broke two minutes for the first time in the 800. Like I said, it was just a great meet. And, uh, you know, but we were there. Uh, we left at 830 in the morning and I didn't get home to my house until 3 a.m. So it's just it's a lot. You know, and and it's a big commitment, but these kids are worth it, and I I'm just putting my priorities towards them, and not myself right now, and that's that's the way it is. You know, I, I'm enjoying it. I I I don't feel bad about it, um, and that's why I just enjoy just going out for a run, whatever it may be. You know, however much I can get in. So uh, that's just where life is right now, and I, I'm I'm enjoying that fact. I'm enjoying the you know being out there, um, coaching, and it's so rewarding. You know, to see these kids when they PR. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm going to keep working on that. Um, 
the uh, the registration for the Flight of the Falcon, the 24-hour event that we're hosting at the West Henderson High School track, is open on Ultra Sign Up. I will put a link in the show notes. Um, we're only taking 25 spots. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping people will come out. We're just asking for, on top of the registration fee, people to raise $250 um, and, you know, come out and, and support the program. The kids will be out there running. Uh, it's really going towards a good cause. These kids have no locker room, nowhere to store their stuff, nowhere to get changed other than in the restrooms. And then they leave their stuff outside, uh, which is just, you know, it, it doesn't seem right to me. So I'm working on trying to get them a building. So, um, yeah, that's what we're working towards. That's what we're raising funds towards. That's what this event is going towards. So it's for a good cause. And if you can't make it, it's August 3rd. Yeah, please share the event. Get it out there for me. I, I really appreciate any support you can throw this way. Um, as soon as we have the donation links up, if you're uh, in the place to donate, uh, I'll put that link up in the show notes as well. Uh, I'll, and I'm going to keep pushing it out on social media. So you'll find the information there, but it's called flight of the Falcon. It's on ultra sign up. Um, and I, I really hope some folks can make it. So thank you for, for, uh, for being a part of, of all of this, uh, really enjoyed it. It was great meeting people at the Asheville trail film festival on Sunday. Uh, really got to, to see so many people. It was such a nice event. Tara Pruitt did amazing. We had her on and we talked about the film festival. It came to uh, came to life Sunday and it was wonderful. Some wonderful, wonderful films um, hit home too. you know, there was uh, there was two films. One was on Western States, which was incredible. Um, and the other was on uh, uh, Leadville. Uh, and, and both were, you know, I, I was I was getting emotional because it brought back a lot of memories. Uh, pretty cool. So um, I, I hope you get to enjoy the film festival wherever you are. Uh, and if you have questions like Drew, please drop me a line, however you want to communicate to me. All my communications, ways of communicating with me are in the show notes. Um, I have uh, I have a few spots that opened up for coaching. Uh, so if it's something you're interested in, please reach out and we'll discuss whether we're a good fit and see if you want to move forward with coaching. So a few spots are open for that. Um, other than that, though, I know that's a lot going on. But uh, I hope your training goes well. Uh, and as always, if you have questions about anything, just reach out. Okay. I appreciate your time. I appreciate you listening, being a part of the podcast. Uh, as always, I appreciate the Patreon support to help me keep doing this. Uh, and until next time, my friends, keep moving forward. Running is life.